Welcome back to Dirty Teeth and thanks for tuning into the channel. It's another glorious day here in Haley, Idaho. Lined up for you is a detailed bike check on the steed that got me through my Everesting challenge with zero mechanicals or issues whatsoever. Let's go geek out inside. I've been fielding a bunch of questions from you guys about what bike I used for Everesting, so I decided to make a video about it. This is Dolphina. She's my trusty Everesting steed. She's also my everyday full suspension mountain bike. My kids named her because she reminds them of a dolphin. <laughs> She's a Niner RKT9 RDO. RKT stands for Rocket. RDO stands for Race Day Optimized, so you can guess it. This is pretty much Niner's cross-country race bike. Dolphina is the only full suspension bike I've ever owned. I bought her specifically for long-distance, single-track bikepacking adventures like the Colorado Trail and the Arizona Trail. Real quick, if you haven't watched my other videos of actually Everesting or my nutrition and hydration plan, I'll put a link to those videos in the description below. My Everesting climb was the gorgeous Trail Creek Road in Sun Valley, Idaho. It can consisted of one mile of pavement before three miles of gravel. The obvious tool of choice for Rebecca Rush and others Everesting the same climb were ultralight gravel bikes. If you follow this channel, you might know that I also have a Salsa Cutthroat, which is basically a beefy gravel bike and would be perfectly suited for this mission. So why did I choose to use a full squish mountain bike that's obviously heavier and less efficient? As I mentioned, I've got some upcoming single track bike packing adventures, so I really wanted to see how she'd perform with long days in the saddle and lots of climbing. I've never really been on her for more than three, four, or six hours at a time. Otherwise, yeah, a 20 pound gravel bike with 45 or 50 seat tires would have been ideal for my route. So would lightweight road shoes instead of my heavier bike packing shoes. But this goes to show you, run what you brung, you can Everest with any type of bike or any type of gear, don't let that stop you. Boom, almost forgot to mention, I just got my Everesting gear in the mail from the Hells 500 crew out in Australia, got my sweet cycling cap and my gray striped socks, super stoked to rock these in the upcoming days. Back to the video. Now that all that's out of the way, let's talk about Dolphina. In Everesting mode, which I'm discussing today, she tips the scales at 24 pounds, 9 ounces. Normally I carry a saddlebag with a repair kit and a mini pump, but for Everesting I left all that stuff in the truck so I could make her as light as possible. One nice bonus to having a full suspension bike was being able to fly down the descents and barely needing to tap my brakes. It also minimized the chatter and fatigue that a rigid bike would have imposed on my forearms and hands. My fork is a Fox Factory 34 step cast in boost 110 spacing with 120 millimeters or roughly five inches of travel. My shock is a Fox Float, also the factory build with 80 millimeters of travel. 80 millimeters of travel might not seem like much, but I find it very efficient while climbing and still super plush while descending. If you're curious, my fork was set to 76 PSI and my shock was set at 150. I've gotten to these settings with much trial and error. They also happen to be pretty similar to the Fox recommended settings for my rider weight. Go figure. As you might imagine, I kept the suspension completely locked out for the climbs and then opened it up for the long fast descents. My upper body stayed nice and fresh and the downhills were smooth as butter. One little Gucci touch is my Synchros front fender which is made specifically to bolt onto Fox forks. I think it's pretty trick and it's way cleaner than the zip ties used on most. I'm rocking Niner flat top RDO carbon bars in a 710mm length with a 31.8mm diameter. These are off an older single speed I had, the newer versions come in a 780mm length, but these fit perfect for me with no cutting. The stem is also a Niner RDO in an 80mm length, and my headset is the uber reliable Cane Creek 40. For grips, I use nothing but Ergon GS2s. I've talked about this before, I swear by them. These are an older version with carbon bar ends, which I don't think they offer anymore. The rubber is almost completely worn out on these grips after thousands of miles of use, but I'm gonna wear them into the ground. The bar ends are great for extra torque when you need to grind out of the saddle, and they also remind me of my glorious single speed days. Brakes. I'm using SRAM 4 piston guide RSC brakes which provide tremendous stopping power. I've got a 180 mil rotor in the front and a 160 in the back. I'm normally a Shimano guy but I've been very impressed with these brakes that came with the bike and the power and modulation is great especially when loaded up for bike packing. For Everesting I threw on new brake pads and I wrapped the levers in electrical tape to make sure my fingers wouldn't go numb during the cold nighttime descents. <laughs> Drivetrain. My drivetrain is a one by, it's 12 speed, and it's a mashup of SRAM, XO, and GX Eagle parts. The bike was specced with all XO components. I ride a bunch and the XO cassettes and chains are very expensive, so when I had to switch them out, I went to the cheaper and heavier GX versions. I do notice the extra weight of the GX cassette, but it's reliable and it's so much cheaper. The cassette has 12 speeds and has a nice wide 10 to 50 tooth range. 
Although SRAM just came out with an extended range 10 to 52 cassette, that might be the ticket next time I have to swap it out. But they also claim you need the new derailleur for it. So I might have to test that theory out. I digress, that's another video. I normally ride with a 32 tooth oval chain ring, but for Everesting, I wanted a little more granny gear for peace of mind. So I switched to a circular 30 tooth that I had lying around. Luckily, I never needed to use the granny gear. I always had at least three or four gears to spare. I'm happy with the 30 tooth and I'll keep it on until I wear it out. But once it's done, I'll switch back to an oval ring. The bottom bracket is a SRAM dub press fit 30, which came with the bike. I've mentioned it before. I think of these bottom brackets as kind of disposable. They're pretty crappy, but they're also cheap. While Everesting, I had no problems with the bottom bracket, no creaking, no issues like that. But since then, it started to creak and I had to replace it. Normally I'd upgrade my bottom bracket, but money's kind of tight right now and good beer ain't cheap. My crank set also came stock on the bike. It's a SRAM X1 carbon with a dub spindle. It's not the lightest, but it's still pretty light, solid and durable. The crank arms are 175 millimeters in length. Not much more to say. My seat post, it's a Niner RDO carbon post. It's 410 millimeters in length and 30.9 millimeters in diameter. It's held on by a Niner seat post clamp. No dropper posts for me. I just set the height for climbing and there's nothing technical to warrant lowering it for the descents. Let's talk about my saddle. Saddles are always subjective. My choice for this bike is the tried and true Physic Gobi M3. It keeps my backside nice and happy. As far as pedals go, I use the Ultralight Crank Brothers Egg Beater 11s. I normally use candies for bike packing, but for Everesting, I decided to shed a few grams, and man, are these pedals light. I love the wheels I built up for this bike. They're strong, reliable, and lightweight. I use Stan's Crest MK3 rims laced to Industry 9 torch hubs. The drilling is 32 hole, and the spacing is boost 15 by 110 in the front and boost 12 by 148 in the rear. I used Wheelsmith double butted black spokes and plain Jane silver nipples, except for a couple blue ones I used on either side of the blue I9 valve stem. I switched out my beefier everyday tires for Continental Race King 2.2s which normally live on my salsa cutthroat. I set them up tubeless with orange seal. These tires are light, have minimal rolling resistance, but still offer great traction. I use the exact same tire on the Tour Divide so I'm pretty intimate with them. Since this ride was mostly gravel with a little bit of pavement, I set tire pressure a little higher than I normally would. I went with 28 PSI in the front and 30 in the back. I don't use a cycling computer for everyday riding. I normally just use the Strava app on my phone, record it and peep it out later. But for Everesting, I wanted a backup way to record my ride just in case my phone died or there was some kind of malfunction. So I'm out on my Garmin E-Trex 30X, which is normally reserved for bikepacking. It's a little overkill, but it was nice eye candy to see how much elevation I'd gained throughout the ride. It also helped with some of the boredom and monotony. I knew I'd be riding in the dark for at least six hours and maybe more, so I needed a reliable handlebar light and helmet light. On my helmet was an exposure joystick, and on my handlebars I used the Lazine 1100 XL. Both are USB rechargeable, and I kept some cache batteries and cables in my truck just in case. I also had my Phoenix LD22 battery powered light as a backup in my truck as well. When I was climbing, I'd conserve juice by just using the handlebar light on low power. When I hit the descents, I'd put both lights on full power, boom. During the day, I let the lights charge in my truck just in case I had to go back into night. Never did, and it all worked out well. I also used a red blinky light in the rear to stay visible during the night laps. It was a Portland Design Works Ather Demon USB rechargeable. Worked great. It's a tight fit in the triangle to fit a water bottle, so I really like the Lazine side-loading water bottle cage. It's way easier to get my bottle in and out than using a traditional cage. 24 ounce bottles barely fit, so I prefer to use a 20 ounce bottle because it can slip in and out easy. I use the right-handed model because that's easier for me, but they make it in two versions. This bike has bosses on the down tube for another bottle cage, which I normally use, but for Everesting, I just wanted to stay minimal and one bottle was all I needed. Strapped to my handlebars is a Revelate feed bag. I needed to eat a bunch and very often, so the food needed to be easy to get at. Normally, I would have used a gas tank for this, but it's currently mounted on my other bike and I was just too lazy to swap it out, but that would have been a little more convenient. I also have a bell, which is great for announcing your presence on trail, but for Everesting, it was great to use as more of a cow bell for cheering on other riders as we passed each other on the route. Oh my gosh, that was a mouthful. Thanks for hanging into the end. That was my Everesting bike check. I have fresh content coming out every week. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Feel free to punch the like button and chime in in the comments down below. Until next time, ride bikes, drink beer, live happy. Thanks so much for squeezing dirty teeth into your busy schedule. 
Please help us reach more people and ensure you receive new videos by giving this video a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell. Until next time, ride bikes, drink beer, live happy.